Chapter 5 Life at Chakpuri was hectic. The amount of things I had to learn really shocked me. Herbs, where they grew, when to gather them, and to be sure that if they were gathered at the wrong time they would be quite useless. That, I was taught, was one of the great secrets of herbalism. The plants, or the leaves, or the barks, or the roots, could only be gathered efficiently within the span of two or three days. The moon had to be right, the stars had to be right, and then the time had to be right also. One must also feel tranquil when gathering such herbs, because, so I was told, one who gathered herbs when in a bad mood would make the herbs not worth the taking. Then we had to dry the things. That was quite a task. Only certain parts of the herbs were useful. Some needed to have just the tips of the leaves removed, others needed to have stalks or bark, and each plant or herb had to be treated in its own individual way and regarded with respect. We took the barks and rubbed them between the hands specially cleaned for the purpose, an ordeal in itself, and so the bark would be reduced to a certain size, sort of granular powder, and then everything had to be laid out on a spotlessly clean floor. No polish on this floor, just rub, 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 until there was no dust, no stain, no mark. Then everything was left out to nature to dry seal the virtues of the herb within that which we had before us. We made herbal tea, that is, infusions of steeped herbs. And I could never understand how people could get the noxious stuff down their throats. It seemed to be an axiom that the worse the taste and the stronger the smell, the more beneficial the medicine. And I will say from my own observation that if a medicine is sufficiently evil-tasting, the poor wretched patient will get better out of fright rather than take the medicine. It is like when one goes to the dentist. The pain will have vanished so that one hesitates on the doorstep, wondering whether one should go through with it. It reminds me rather of the pallid and anxious young man, a recent bridegroom, who, accompanying his very, very pregnant bride to the hospital for her time was upon her. As he turned before the reception desk, he said, Oh, gee, honey, are you sure you really want to go through with this? As a special student, one who had to learn more, faster, I was not only confined to Chakpuri, my time was also devoted to studies at the Patala. Here I had all the most learned lamas, each to teach me his own speciality. I learned various forms of medicine. I learned acupuncture, and in later years, with the weight of many years of experience, I came to the inescapable conclusion that acupuncture was a wondrous thing indeed for those of the East, those who had been long conditioned to acupuncture. But then, as I found in China, you get sceptical Westerners to deal with. Well, unfortunately, they were hypnotized by their own disbelief of anything that didn't come from God's own country. There were sacred passages to be seen deep, deep below the mountains of Patala. Down below there was an immense cave with what seemed to be an inland sea. That, I was told, was a remnant of the time so long ago when Tibet was a pleasant land beside the sea. Certainly in that immense cave I saw strange remnants, skeletons of fantastic creatures which much, much later in life I recognized to be mastodons, dinosaurs and other exotic fauna. Then in many places one would find great slabs of natural crystal and in the natural crystal one could see kelp, different types of seaweed and occasionally a perfectly preserved fish completely embedded in clear crystal. These were indeed regarded as sacred objects, as messages from the past. Kite flying was an art at which I excelled. Once a year we went into the high mountains to gather rare herbs and to generally have recreation from the quite arduous life of the lamasery. Some of us, the more foolhardy of us, flew in man-lifting kites, and I thought first that here was that which had been described in the prophecy, but then I came to my senses and realized it could not be a man-flying kite, because these kites were connected to the earth by ropes, and, should a rope be broken or escape from the clutches of the many monks, 
then the kite would fall and there would be the death of the person riding in it. There were quite a number of interviews with the innermost one, our thirteenth Dalai Lama, and I felt such love and respect for him. He knew that in a few more years Tibet would be an enslaved state, but the gods had foretold, and the gods must be obeyed. There could be no real form of resistance because there were no real weapons in Tibet. You cannot oppose a man with a rifle when all you have is a prayer wheel or a string of beads. I received my instructions, my sacred orders, from the great thirteenth. I received guidance and advice, and the love and understanding which my own parents had completely denied me, and I decided that come what may I would do my best. There had been times when I had seen my father. Each time he had turned away from me, frozen-faced, as if I was the lowest of the low, beneath his contempt. Once, almost at the end of my stay in the Patala, I had visited my parents at home. Mother sickened me by her excess formality, by the manner in which she treated me purely as a visiting lama. Father, true to his belief, would not receive me and shut himself in his study. Yes, Odara, my sister, looked at me as if I were some freak or figment from a particularly bad nightmare. Eventually I was summoned again to the innermost one's apartments, and told much that I do not propose to repeat here. One thing he did tell me was that on the very next week I would go to China to study as a medical student at the University of Chongqing. But I was instructed I must take a different name. I could not use my own name of Rampa, or certain elements of a Chinese rebellion would seize me and use me as a bargaining tool. There was in existence in China at that time a faction devoted to the overthrow of the government and who were prepared to adopt any methods whatever to achieve their objective. So I was told to pick a name. Now how could a poor Tibetan boy, one just approaching manhood admittedly, but how could he pick a Chinese name when he didn't know anything about China? I pondered on that awful question, and then unbidden, unexpectedly, a name appeared in my mind. I would call myself Kuno Suo, which in one dialect of China meant Priest of the Hill. Surely that was an appropriate name, but it was a name which people found difficult to pronounce, Western people, that is, and so it soon became shortened to Kuan. Well, the name was settled. My papers were in order. I was given special papers from the Patala testifying to my status and to the standards I had reached because, as I was told, and as I found to be absolutely correct later, Western people would not believe anything unless it was on the paper or could be felt or torn to pieces. So my papers were prepared and handed to me with great ceremony. Soon came the day when I had to ride all the way to Chungking. My guide, the Lama Mingya Dundup, and I had a most sad farewell. He knew I would not see him again while he was in the body. He gave me many assurances that I would meet him often in the astral. I had a party of people going with me to protect me from Chinese brigands and to be able to report my safe arrival at Chongqing. We started off and rode steadily all along through the highlands of the plain of Lhasa, and then we descended to the lowlands, a place which was almost tropical in the exotic flora, wonderful rhododendrons. We passed many lamaseries, and quite frequently we spent the night in them if they happened to be on our path at a suitable time. I was a lama, actually I was an abbot, and a recognized incarnation. Thus, when we went to a lamasery, we were indeed given special treatment, but I did not welcome such special treatment, because each time it reminded me of the hardships of my life yet to be endured. Eventually we left the borders of Tibet and entered China. Here in China every large village seemed to be infested with Russian communists, white men who were standing up usually on an ox cart telling the workers of the wonders of communism and how they should rise and massacre those who were landowners, telling them how China belonged to the people. Well, now apparently it does, and what a mess they have made of it. The days passed 
and our seemingly endless journey became shorter. It was quite annoying to be accosted by certain of the Chinese peasants who gaped at me because I looked somewhat like a Westerner. I had grey eyes instead of brown, and my hair was very dark, but still not shiny black, so the story went around that I was a Russian in disguise. Nowadays, since my life in the West, I have had all manner of strange tales told about me. One tale which amused me immensely was to the effect that I was really a German who had been sent to Lhasa by Hitler so that I could learn all the secrets of the occult, and then I would come back to Berlin and win the war for Hitler by magical means. Well, in those days I didn't even know there was such a man as Hitler. It is a most remarkable thing how a Westerner will believe anything except that which is utterly true. The more true a matter, the more difficult the Westerner finds it to believe. But while on the subject of Hitler and the Tibetans, it was a fact that a small group of Tibetans were captured by the Nazis during the war and were compelled to go to Berlin. But they certainly did nothing to help win the war, as history proves. At last we turned a corner in the road, and then we came in sight of the old city of Chongqing. This city was built on high cliffs, and far down below the river flowed. One of the rivers was particularly familiar to me, and that was the Chiyaling. So the high city of Chongqing, with its stepped streets, with many a cobble, was washed at its base by two rivers, the Yangtze and the Chiyaling. Where the two met, a fresh branch was formed, and so the city appeared from afar to be an island. Seven hundred and eighty steps we climbed up to the city itself. We gazed like yokels at the shops, and what to us seemed to be brilliantly lit stores containing articles which were completely beyond our understanding. Things in windows glittered. From many stores came noises, foreigners speaking to each other out of boxes, and then there came blasts of music out of other boxes. It was all a complete marvel to us, and I, knowing that I would have to spend a long time in such surroundings, began almost to quake with fear at the thought. My retinue were embarrassing me by the manner in which they gaped. Each of the men was shaking with nervousness, and each of them had his mouth open and eyes wide open too. I thought we must look a sorry bunch of country bumpkins gazing like this. But then I thought we weren't here for that, after all. I had to register at the university, and so we made our way there. My companions waited in the grounds outside while I entered and made my formal appearance, producing the envelope which I had so carefully safeguarded all the way from Lhasa. I worked hard in the university. My form of education had been quite different from that which was demanded by the university system, and so I had to work at least twice as hard. The principal of the university had warned me that conditions would be difficult. He said that he had been qualified in the latest American systems, and with his very capable staff he was bringing a mixture of Chinese and American medicine and surgery to the students. The academic work was hard because I knew nothing of electricity, but I soon learned. Anatomy was easy. I had studied that quite thoroughly with the disposers of the dead in Lhasa, and it amused me greatly when we were first ushered into the dissecting rooms where the dead bodies lay about to find so many of the students turn a pale green and become violently sick, while others just fainted away on the floor. It was such a simple matter to realize that these dead bodies would not feel anything by our amateurish efforts upon them. They were just like a suit of old clothes which had been discarded, and which would be cut up, perhaps to make other garments. No, the academic matter was difficult at first, but eventually I was able to take my place quite near the top of the class. At about this time I noticed that there was a very, very old Buddhist priest who was giving lectures at the university, and I made some inquiries and was told, Oh, you don't want to bother about him. He's just an old crackpot. He's weird. Well, that persuaded me that I would have to do extra work to attend the old crackpot's lectures. It was well worth while. I formally requested permission to attend and was gladly accepted. A few lectures later, 
we were all sitting down and our lecturer entered. As was the custom, we rose and remained standing until he told us to be seated. Then he said, There is no death, no death. I thought, Oh, there is going to be a lecture on the occult. He is going to call death transition, which, after all, is what it is. But the old lecturer let us stew in our own impatience for a time, and then he chuckled and went on, I mean that literally. If we only knew how we could prolong life indefinitely. Let us look at the process of ageing, and then I hope you will see what I mean. He said, A child is born and follows a certain pattern of growth. At a varying age it varies according to each person. Real development is stated to have stopped. Real worthwhile growth has stopped. And from then on there is what is known as the degeneration of old age, where we get a tall man becoming shorter as his bones shrink. He looked about to see if we were following, and when he saw my particular interest, he nodded and smiled most amiably. He continued, A person has to be rebuilt cell by cell, so that if we get a cut, a part of the brain has to remember the pattern of the flesh before the cut, and then we must supply identical or near-identical cells to repair the defect. Now, every time we move, we cause cells to wear out, and all those cells have to be rebuilt, replaced. Without an exact memory, we should not be able to rebuild the body as it was. He looked about again, then pursed his lips, and said, If the body, or rather if the brain forgets the precise pattern, then the cells may grow wild. They grow according to no previous pattern, and thus those wild cells are called cancer cells. It means that they are cells which have escaped from the control of that part of the brain which should regulate their precise pattern. Thus it is, you get a person with great growths on his body. That is caused by cells growing in haphazard fashion, and which have escaped from the brain's control. He stopped to take a sip of water, and then continued. Like most of us, the growth and replacing centre of the brain has a faulty memory. After reproducing cells for a few thousand times, it forgets the precise pattern, and with each succeeding growth of cells, there is a difference, so that eventually we have that which we call ageing. Now, if we could remind the brain constantly of the exact shape and size of each cell to be replaced, then the body would always appear to be of the same age. In short, we would have immortality. Immortality except in the case of total destruction of the body or damage to the cells. I thought of this, and then it came to me in a flash that my guide, the Lama Mingyar Dundup, had told me the same thing in somewhat different words, and I had been too young or too stupid, or both, to understand what he really meant. Our lectures were interesting. We studied so many subjects not studied in the West. In addition to ordinary Western type of medicine and surgery, we studied acupuncture and herbal remedies, but it wasn't all work and no play, although nearly so. One day, when I was out with a friend, we wandered down to the shore of the rivers, and there we saw an aeroplane which had been parked and just left for some reason. The engine was ticking over, and the propeller was just revolving. I thought of the kites I had flown, and I said to my friend, I bet I could fly that thing. He roared with derision, and so I said, All right, I'll show you. I looked around to see there was no one about, and I got in that contraption, and, to my own surprise, and to the surprise of many watchers, I did fly the thing, but not in the manner prescribed. My aerobatics were quite involuntary, and I survived and landed safely, only because I had keener reflexes than most. I was so fascinated with that highly dangerous flight that I learned to fly officially, and, because I showed more than average promise as an airman, I was offered a commission in the Chinese forces. By Western standards, the style and rank granted to me was surgeon captain. After I had graduated as a pilot, the commanding officer told me to continue my studies until I had graduated also as a physician and surgeon. That was soon done, and at last, 
armed with quite a lot of official-looking papers, I was ready to leave Chongqing. But there came a very sad message concerning my patron, the thirteenth Dalai Lama, the inmost one, and so, obeying a summons, I returned to Lhasa for a very brief time. Destiny called, however, and I had to follow the dictates of those in authority above me, and so I retraced my steps on to Chongqing and then on to Shanghai. For a time I was on the reserve as an officer of the Chinese forces. The Chinese were having a most difficult time because the Japanese were trying to find an excuse to invade China. All manner of indignities were being heaped upon foreigners in the hope that the foreigners would make trouble for the government of China. Men and women were being stripped naked in public and given a body search by Japanese soldiers who said they were suspecting the foreigners of taking messages. I saw one young woman who resisted. She was stripped naked and made to stand for hours in the centre of a busy street. She was truly hysterical, but every time she tried to run away, one of the sentries would prod her obscenely with a bayonet. The Chinese people watching could do nothing. They did not want an international incident. But then one old Chinese woman threw a coat to the young woman so that she could cover herself. A sentry jumped at her and with one slash cut off the arm that had thrown the coat. It amazes me now, after all I have seen, after all I have suffered, that people the world over seem to be rushing to the Japanese offering them friendship, etc., presumably because they offer in return cheap labour. The Japanese are a blight upon the earth because of their insane lust to dominate. In Shanghai I had my own private practice as a doctor and a quite successful one too. Perhaps if the Japanese war had not started, I should have made my living in Shanghai. But on the 7th of July 1937, there was an incident at the Marco Polo Bridge. That incident really started the war. I was called up and sent to Shanghai docks to supervise the assembling of a very large three-engined aeroplane which had been stored there ready for collection by a firm which had proposed to start a passenger airline. With a friend I went to the docks and we found that aeroplane in pieces, the fuselage and the wings all separate. The undercarriage was not even connected and the three engines were separately crated. By dint of much psychometry and even more attempts at the use of common sense, I managed to direct workers to assemble the aircraft on a very large open space. As far as I could, I checked everything over. I examined the engines, made sure they had the right fuel and the right oil. One by one I started those engines and tried them out, let them idle and let them roar, and when I was satisfied after many adjustments that they would keep going, I taxied that three-engined plane up and down that large tract of land so that I would get used to the feel of the thing, because one doesn't stunt too long on a three-engined plane. At last I was satisfied that I understood the controls and could handle them quite well. Then with a friend who had a tremendous amount of faith in me, we got into the plane and taxied to the extreme edge of the wide open space. I had coolies put large chocks in front of the wheels with instructions to pull on the ropes to move the chocks immediately I raised my right hand. Then I opened all three throttles, so the plane roared and shook. At last I raised my hand. The chocks were pulled out and we cavorted madly across the ground. At the last moment I pulled back on the control and we went up at what I believe was a truly unorthodox angle but we were flying, and we flew around for an hour or two to get the feel of the thing. Eventually we came back to the landing space, and I was careful to note the direction of smoke. I came in slowly and landed into the wind, and I confess that I was bathed in perspiration. My friend was, too, in spite of all his faith in me. Later I was told to remove the plane to another area, where it could be guarded day and night, because the International Brigade was becoming very active, and some of these foreigners thought they could do just what they liked with the property of the Chinese. We did not want our big aeroplane damaged. At a secluded base, 
the plane was altered, much of the seating was removed, and stretchers were put in on racks. At one end of the plane there was a metal table fitted, and this was going to be an operating theatre. We were going to do emergency operations because now, at the end of 1938, the enemy were approaching the outskirts of Shanghai, and I had instructions to close my practice, which I had still been carrying on part-time. I was told to take the plane to a safe area while it could be repainted all white with a red cross. It also was to have ambulance plane painted on it in Chinese and Japanese characters. But when painted, the paint was not destined to last very long. Bombs were dropping over Shanghai, and the air was full of the acrid stench of explosives, full of particles of grit which stung the nostrils, irritated the eyes, and scoured the paint from Old Abbey, as we called our aeroplane. Soon there came a greater crump, and Abbey jumped into the air and collapsed flat on the underside of the fuselage. A near bomb burst had blown off the undercarriage. With immense labour and considerable ingenuity, we repaired the undercarriage with lengths of split bamboo, like putting splints on a broken limb, I thought. But with the bamboo lashed firmly in place, I taxied up and down the bomb-pitted ground to see how the ship would manage. It certainly seemed to be all right. We were sitting in the plane when there was a great commotion, and an irate Chinese general, full of pomp and self-assurance, came onto our airfield surrounded by subservient members of his staff. Brusquely, he ordered us to fly him to a certain destination. He would not take our statement that the plane really was not fit to fly until further repairs had been carried out. He would not accept our statement that we were an ambulance plane and were not permitted by international law to carry armed men. We argued, but his argument was stronger. He just had to say, take these men and shoot them for failing to obey military orders, and that would have been the end of us. We would have gone flying off without him. The troop of men climbed into the plane, tossing out medical equipment, just scattering it out of the open door to make room for their own comforts. Out went our stretchers, out went our operating table, our instruments, everything. They were just tossed away as if they were garbage and would never be wanted again. As it happened, they weren't. We took off and headed toward our destination, but then some two hours away from our point of departure, red devils came out of the sun, Japanese fighter planes, hordes of them, like a load of mosquitoes. The hated red symbol glowed brightly from the wings. They circled our ambulance plane with the red crosses so prominently displayed and then, quite callously, they took turns to pump bullets into us. Since that time I have never liked the Japanese, but I was to have more fuel for the flame of my dislike in days to come. We were shot down, and I was the only one left alive. I fell into about the most unsalubrious place in China, a sewage ditch, where all the waste matter was collected, and so I fell into the sewage ditch and went all the way to the bottom, and in that incident I broke both ankles. Japanese soldiers arrived, and I was dragged off to their headquarters, and very, very badly treated indeed, because I refused to give them any information, except that I was an officer of the Chinese services. It seemed to annoy them considerably, because they kicked out my teeth, pulled off all my nails, and did other unpleasant things from which I still suffer. For instance, I had hoses inserted into my body, and into the water supply was put mustard and pepper. Then the taps were turned on, and my body swelled enormously, and tremendous damage was caused inside. That is one of the reasons I suffer so much even now, all these years later. But there is no point in getting into detail because an interested person can read it all in The Doctor from Lhasa. I wish more people would read that book to let them see what, well you know what, sort of people the Japanese are. But I was sent to a prisoner of war camp for women because this was considered to be degrading. Some of the women had been captured from places like Hong Kong. Some of them were in truly shocking conditions because of continual rapes. 
It is worth mentioning that at this time there were certain German officers who were advising the Japanese, and these officers were always provided with the best looking of the women and the perversions. Well, I have never seen anything like it. It does seem that the Germans excel not merely at making war, but at other things as well. After a time, when my ankles had healed and my nails had regrown, I managed to make an escape, and I made my slow, painful way back to Chungking. This was not yet in the hands of the Japanese, and my medical colleagues there did wonders in restoring my health. My nose had been broken. Before being broken, it had been, according to Western standards, somewhat squat. But now, through the exigencies of surgery, my nose became quite a large affair, which would have done credit to any Westerner. But war came to Chungking, the violent war of Japanese occupation. Once again, I was captured and tortured, and eventually, I was again put in charge of a prison camp where I did the best I could for the patients among the prisoners. Unfortunately, a senior officer was transferred from another area, and he recognized me as an escaped prisoner. All the trouble started again. I had both legs broken in two places to teach me not to escape. Then they put me on a rack and pulled my arms and legs very tight indeed. In addition, I had such a blow across the lower spinal region that grave complications were caused, which even now are making my spine degenerate. So much so that I can no longer stand upright. Once again, after my wounds healed, I managed to escape. Being in an area where I was well known, I made my way to the home of certain missionaries, who were full of tut tuts and great exclamations of sorrow, compassion, the works. They treated my wounds, gave me a narcotic, and sent for the Japanese prison guards because, as they said. They wanted to protect their own mission, and I was not one of them. Back in the prison camp, I was so badly treated that it was feared that I should not survive, and they wanted me to survive because they were sure I had information they needed, information which I refused to give. At last, it was decided that I escaped far too easily, and so I was sent to the mainland of Japan to a village near the sea. Near a city called Hiroshima, I was again put in charge as medical officer of a prison camp for women, women who had been brought from Hong Kong, Shanghai, and other cities, and who were being kept there with some dim view on the part of the Japanese that they could be used as hostages when bargaining later because the war was going very badly for the Japanese now, and the leaders knew full well that they had no hope of winning. One day there was the sound of aircraft engines, and then the ground shook, and an immense pillar appeared in the distance—a pillar in the shape of a mushroom, with rolling clouds spreading high into the sky. About us there was utter panic; the guards scattered like scared rats, and I, ever alert for such an opportunity, vaulted over a fence and made my way down to the water's edge. A fishing boat was there, empty. I managed to climb aboard, and with a pole just had enough strength left to push the boat into deeper water. Then I collapsed into the stinking bilge. The boat swept out to sea on the tide which was receding, but I, up to my neck in water in the bottom of the boat, knew nothing about it until at last I dizzily awakened, and it came back to me with a start that once again I had escaped. Painfully, I dragged myself a bit higher out of the water. And looked anxiously about. The Japanese, I thought, would be sending out speedboats to capture a many-time runaway, but no, there were no boats at all in sight. But on the skyline over the city of Hiroshima, there was a dull, evil red glow, and the sky was black. And from that blackness, there dropped things, blood-red splotches, sooty masses, black, greasy rain. I was aching with hunger. I looked about. And found a locker in the side of the bulkhead toward the bows, and in that locker there were pieces of stale fish, which presumably were meant to be used as bait. They were sufficient to maintain a certain amount of life in me, and I was most grateful to the fishermen who had left them there. I lay back across the seats of the boat and felt great unease, 
because the boat was rocking in a most strange manner. The sea itself seemed strange. There were waves of a type I had not seen before, almost as if there was an underwater earthquake. I looked about me, and the impression was eerie. There was no sign of life. Normally, on such a day, there would have been innumerable fishing boats about because fish was the staple food of the Japanese. I felt a great sense of unease because, being telepathic and clairvoyant, I was obtaining remarkable impressions, so confused and so many that I just could not understand them. All the world seemed to be quiet except for a strange sighing of the wind. Then, high above me, I saw a plane, a very large plane. It was circling about and through being observant I could see the large lens of an aerial camera pointing down. Obviously photographs were being taken of the area for some reason which I then did not know. Soon the plane turned about and went off beyond the range of my vision, and I was alone again. There were no birds in sight. Strange, I thought, because the seabirds always came to the fishing boats. But there were no other boats about either. There was no sign of life anywhere and I had these peculiar impressions coming to my extra senses. At last, I suppose, I fainted, because everything suddenly went black. The boat, with my unconscious form, drifted on into the unknown.